Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Hold My Nuggets Incorporated for your 2019 NFL postseason divisional weekend post game analysis show. I am your host, the diligent, vigilant, meticulous, sagacious, conscientious, analytical, methodical individual, the chiseled Adonis. And this past weekend, we had some very, very good football. Some upsets people did not expect to see, or I should say, there was only one, and uh, a blowout that turned into a blowout the other way. I've never seen necrophilia go in reverse. But first and foremost, I was two and two on my picks. Now I know what you guys are saying, but I thought you were gonna be one and three. That's bullshit, man. What pick did you take? Remember I said, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you're gonna miss when I change my mind. There was a couple of games that I felt as if could switch. You know, on the drop of the hat. Initially, that was going to be Minnesota and, and the 49ers, but I still felt in my soul perhaps Minnesota would pull off the upset. I was wrong for Minnesota fans. Wrong. Every time I pick you guys to win, you lose. Every time I pick you to lose, you win. Uh, but maybe this time you should start cheering for us to lose. Then we win the Super Bowl. If you think they winning because I say they're going to lose, Get your head out of the Genjutsu you're in. Please get yourself out of it, stupid. They lost. But here was what the change of the pick was. It was what's going on in Baltimore. And you saw me put up the screenshot and I put it on YouTube. Now, if you if you didn't see it, you got to go to the community, you know, uh, 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 location, the tab on my, you know, channel. And then you'll see it there, okay? But the, I'll get to why I switched that up a little bit later. But first, let's go game by game. First and foremost, the very first game of this past weekend's divisional round, the Minnesota Vikings, the sixth seed, traveling to take on the 49ers, the one seed in Levi Stadium where Brett Favre is not allowed because he's sponsored by Wranglers. Now, let's look at it like this. This game was owned by the 49ers the second they took the lead. The second they took the lead. First and foremost, they scored first. Minnesota tied it up, right? So let's not say the second they took the lead. But once they, you know, took the lead again. Let's say take the lead again. All right? Because they went down the field with ease. Eight plays, 61 yards, a touchdown in four minutes, right? Emmanuel Sanders had two great catches on that drive to put them in the position to go and score, right? Minnesota had to earn every single yard to even up the score at seven. And after that, it was all San Francisco. They took the lead 14 to 17. Minnesota would respond with a field goal. Oh, I said 14 to 17. 14 to 7. Minnesota responded with a field goal. And then we saw a field goal from the 49ers. And then a touchdown, a field goal, and Minnesota never responded. I'll tell you this much. As I said, I felt as if that defensive line would be the difference maker for Minnesota. And early on, it looked as if they were going to make a couple of plays. They got to Jimmy G, but overall, they were gassed and could not make, you know, the plays that they needed to make. But on the opposite side of the football, you saw that defensive line of the 49ers get the job done. I expected them to play well. I didn't expect them to play this well. I thought Minnesota playing as high and great as they did last week would try to replicate that same performance. That was not the case. First and foremost, the offensive line barely got off the ball in order to block on running uh, you know, running plays. They got completely outclassed, outcoached at the line. Bottom line. And when that happens, the dreadlocks backfield of Alexander Madison and Dalvin Cook did virtually nothing. They combined for over, you know, 150 yards last week. This week, Dalvin Cook had 18 yards on nine carries. Alexander Madison only had three yards on one carry. You run the football 10 times and your name is the Minnesota Vikings, led by Kirk family member Cousins. You're not going to have a good time. And speaking of Kirk family member Cousins, a lot of people talk about, well, we found out today he can't get the job done. He was 21-29, 172 yards of TD and an INT. It's not like he didn't play all right. But he needed his players to show up. And what did we see? I told you guys Stephon Diggs had to step up this particular game. Outside of that one touchdown catch, he did nothing. He had two catches, 57 yards, and one TD. Where were you at? I thought you were supposed to be ascending and possibly consider yourself elite. That was not the case. Adam Thielen, five catches, 50 yards. His presence was barely felt. Minnesota did nothing for virtually three quarters. They were in the game for the first quarter and then did not or nothing. It was ridiculous. San Francisco owned them. You talk about taking your nutsack out and rubbing it all over them. That's exactly what Tevin Coleman did. 22 carries, 105 yards, and two TDs. 
Porn star Jimmy G only had to throw the football 19 times, and he was 11 to 19, 131 yards of TD, and also an INT to, um, I believe it was Eric Kendricks who ended up catching the pick. But regardless of whatever the hell happened early in the first quarter, the 49ers took care of business. They took care of business. If you look at the split, you know, down, um, to close out the game, the, the 49ers pretty much owned it. They owned it for the whole second half. What did the Vikings do? Nothing. And it was sad to see because Mike Zimmer, let's just be honest, man, who knows how many other seasons he's going to have at head coach. The man's quite old. He's rather old. So I would hope they'd be able to bring this team back next year, possibly add to their secondary because I'll tell you this much, Xavier Rhodes was getting cooked all damn game. The man gets beat on every slant, every sp and, and, and more importantly, their secondary, I'm not too sure if they're sponsored by Charmin because they play ridiculously soft coverage. I don't know why that is. You go out there and you play the worst possible zone where you don't even try to disguise it. And it's not as if you're bringing a blitz underneath. They drop into coverage and then quarterback has all the time in the world to go and find somebody to get open. I'm not too sure what the hell they were trying to do, but it did not work in their favor. I can tell you that much. Good victory for the um, San Francisco 49ers, and they will host next week. You know, uh, um, they, they will be hosting the Green Bay Packers, and that's going to be a very exciting game. All right, Nick Bosa had two sacks on this particular game as well. I believe they had a total of five sacks, you know, from San Francisco. It was a very good performance. Kudos to those guys moving on to the next round. And for the Minnesota Vikings, they and that dog on death note. All right, you are who the hell we thought you were. And now to the game where I actually switched my pick, and I'll tell you why. Going into this game, I felt as if it could go either way, right? It was a very tough game for me to pick. But I said, you know what? I believe this is going to come off the toes of Justin Tucker. I believe it will be a close game. You'll be lucky if you even see a touchdown. And then I got an update on Twitter. And I saw a man walking towards the locker room as he arrived to M&T Bank Stadium. Dressed in all white. Looking like a heavenly shaft. Pause. No homo. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But the man came dressed in white. And I said, wait a minute, who is that? It looked as if it was a chocolate bar. It was, oh, Henry. Pause. He was a chocolate bar. Wait a minute. Is that saying he's edible? Not that there's anything wrong with that, Michael said. But Derrick Henry showed up in all white. And when you show up with the uh, the drip drop, as Antonio Brown would say, you got you you better have a good game. So immediately I sat here on the edge of my bed, edge of my seat, and said, you know what? I'm going to have to switch. I'm going with Tennessee. People on, on Twitter, they know. So if you're not keeping up on Twitter, you won't know about the switch of the picks. And what happened? Derrick Henry went out there. And you saw Earl Thomas early in the season talking about, hey, man, whoever we play in the Super Bowl, they about to be in trouble. You heard Earl Thomas say after the wild card game of what he saw New England do, it looked like those guys wasn't ready to, you know, they didn't really want to go and tackle Derrick Henry. Well, guess what, Earl Thomas? You got transmogrified into a lead-blocking fullback this past Sunday, Saturday. You got to be kidding me. Derrick Henry, 195 yards on the ground. First running back in history to have three consecutive games over 180 yards. This man's a beast. This man's an absolute beast. And let me tell you something. And if you look in the comment section, I believe I spoke about it with one person individual or, or in particular. You shot yourself out because they asked, man, Adonis, who you have for, for the Super Bowl? Because you've constantly said you're not going to say who you predict to be in the Super Bowl until about week 16, week 17 going into Wild Card Weekend. I said for the NFC, I had two teams. Green Bay, New Orleans. New Orleans is gone. Green Bay is still in the tournament. In the AFC, there were three teams. Baltimore, Houston, Tennessee. Two are gone, Tennessee remains. Tennessee has the blueprint to go all the way. They run the football, they chew the clock, and they play good defense. And it's tough to beat a team like that. Oh, but the quarterback plays not spectacular from Ryan Tannehill. It doesn't have to be. If you're running for damn near 200 yards, you're killing the opposing team on the clock, and whenever they have the football, it's damn near meaningless. Might have, as, as I might add, you're taking the football away as well. It's kind of hard to beat that team. Because Baltimore had three turnovers, and they got stopped on fourth down, I think, three different occasions. You talk about masterclass football. Mike Vrabel is coaching up this team to the nines. All right? First, we got we to gotta look at the, uh, the INT. Off the fingertips of Mark Andrews. He should have caught that football. 
Not Lamar's fault. All right? Kevin Bayard takes it back to, I believe it was midfield. And then we saw a touchdown from Ryan Tannehill after they marched down the field. Right? After that, we see a, tur a turnover on downs for Baltimore. And what happens? The very next play, Tennessee finds the end zone. Once again, now you're down 14-0. Wait a minute now. Baltimore can't play their game anymore. You can't go out there and run the football over 30 times. I thought this was going to be a very, you know, a short game as I predicted. I said this might not last over two and a half hours because these teams going to combine for well over 75 carries apiece. Oh, no, Baltimore kind of had to go and, you know, abandon that. Designed run plays for running backs? Oh, that only happened nine times. Mark Ingram only had six carries. Gus Edwards only had three carries. Lamar Jackson had 143 yards on the ground, but he had to run 20 times. And let me just point out to you, majority of those times, it was not a designed run for him. So he almost had to make something out of nothing. Baltimore lost their identity. They didn't have those designed runs anymore because you're down 14-0. You can't afford to go out there and keep trying to run the football. And then what do we see happen? A punt. They finally got a field goal on the board. And then another field goal. But... Tennessee played very stout. They kept them out of the end zone early. They kept them out of the end zone often. And more importantly, on those key fourth downs, you saw them turn the football over, or over on downs four different times. It wasn't three. It was four. Right? Second half, Baltimore comes out, open in possession. Turnover on downs once again. They get stopped on fourth down. What does Tennessee do to respond? Oh, let me just get a 21-yard touchdown. I'm Derrick Henry. Although I ran all the way down the field, you thought I was going to run it into the end zone. Let me turn it to Tim Tebow and throw the football to my man Corey Davis in the back of the end zone touchdown. And might I add, on that play, Marcus Peters had outside contain. If Derrick Henry just looked and saw where Marcus Mariota had went, he could have thrown a touchdown over there as well. Or if he tucked the football and decided to go forward, there's no doubt in my mind he would have scored on the ground. They would have scored from three different angles on that particular play. Or I should say, they should have scored from three different angles on that particular play. Now you're up 21 to six. It's complete desperation football for the Baltimore Ravens. What do they do now? Well, we just go fumble on our first play. No protection. Lamar Jackson kind of held on to the ball a little bit too long. But nobody got open. Fumble on the play picked up. Tennessee adds to their lead up 28-6. to As Derrick Henry got all the attention once again, Ryan Tannehill went into the end zone. And now you are in quite the predicament for Baltimore. You're not allowed to run the football no more. Interception follows. We're entering the fourth quarter. You're now down 28-6. to all you can do is throw. This is where the criticism of Lamar Jackson comes in. A lot of people talk about, man, he can't throw the football. Although he had over um, 500 yards of total offense himself, that's the only criticism you can have, man. Guys were dropping the football left and right. Dropping the football left and right. It's not all on the shoulders of Lamar Jackson. Because in my opinion, he didn't play his best game, but damn it, he did what he could. When Hayden Hurst is dropping footballs, when Mark Andrews is dropping footballs, when Willie Sneed is dropping footballs, when Roberts is dropping footballs, what the hell are you going to do? What are you going to do? Hollywood Brown, I told you guys already, this ain't somebody who's going to kill somebody or, you know, kill a defender like that. He'll get his occasional one or two plays and that's pretty much it. He's done for the game. He's not a threat. Tough loss for Baltimore. It literally could have went either way, but after... Tennessee got out to that start, and Baltimore had to play catch-up. I don't believe they're one of those football teams that can play catch-up. They're a team that plays in close games or has the lead. If you have Baltimore down by two scores, by three scores, take the L out of love. It's over, brother. They're not that other team from, you know, Missouri. They ain't from there. And now Tennessee's going on to the AFC Championship. But let me tell you something. Tennessee can either be the 2005 Pittsburgh Steelers or the 2017 Jacksonville Jaguars. They have an opportunity to be one or the other. It's entirely on their hands because their style of football, the way they're playing right now, reminds me a lot of those two teams. It is entirely on the shoulders of Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill. I'm excited to see what this AFC Championship is going to look like. And at where I sit right now, I'm undecided for all of the games. However, I'll say this much. I did say there was five teams, I believe, that can make it to the Super Bowl. Two of those five remain. 
being Tennessee and Green Bay. And you know what? I think those are going to be the teams I pick. But of course, when we do our pregame towards the tail end of this week, we'll see exactly what it is that I feel. Then we move on to Sunday uh, in the very confusing game. And this game, I actually chose Houston to win. And early on, it looked like they were going to prove me right. And then all of a sudden, Jeffrey Dahmer decided, hey, I'm going to switch up my jersey. Let me put on this Kansas City jersey. And Kansas City came alive. Bill O'Brien, um, I would hope this man has his job called tonight. He's called into the office. He gets fired. He should have been gone after that. Because Houston goes down the field. They get a touchdown. They block a punt. They get a touchdown. Within five minutes, you're up 14, right? Both teams exchange punts. Houston gets another touchdown. You're up 21-0. You have a fumble, right? On the, uh, uh, um, no, the fumble was on the, uh, uh, yeah, the fumble was following, T Tariq Hill's fumble led to that touchdown. Now you get a field goal from Kaimi Fairbairn on a situation where it was a fourth down in one. You guys were probably going to go for it. You call a timeout, start second guessing yourself. What was the purpose of that? You're up 21. You want to put the nail you want to take the dead Namekki into the mausoleum and put the nail in the coffin? Go for it on fourth and one because your defense, for the most part at this point, has been doing their job. Kansas City hasn't scored. Their hands are anemic at this point because Travis Kelsey dropped the football on third down. Uh, uh, um, Robinson dropped the football on, on third down as well. Uh, and then you had the uh, the, the block punt. Oh, uh, uh, no, no. the uh, yeah, yeah, then the block punt. So it appears these guys can't catch the football. They're already rattled. Go for it on first or on fourth down, and maybe you can put 28 points on the board. But no, they settle for the um, for the field goal. Take a 24 to zero lead. Early in the season, we've seen Oakland jump out to a 10 zero lead over Kansas City, and they respond in the second quarter and put up 28 points. So this is a team that is very capable of putting up points fast, putting up points often. They put up a 41-point run, unanswered. Seven consecutive drives in which they scored with a touchdown. But then seven touchdowns, does it equal 41 points? That just means that Houston scored finally after the sixth score. And then Kansas City said, oh, word, you scored. How about another one? Complete necrophilia went in one direction to the other. And we ain't talking about Zane. I can't remember the doggone name. I hope he's spotted in one direction. Whatever the case may have been, the Houston Texans blew it again. A whole lot of erotic asphyxiation coming from the NRG Stadium. And they, and they somehow sent it all the way to Arrowhead. How the hell? What, what, what was going through the minds of Houston? How do you allow this to happen? Your defense, and I told you guys going into this game, I did not trust the Kansas City defense. But you didn't see the last 10 games of the season? They were operating as one of the best teams in the league. This is Andy Reid. This is the Kansas City Chiefs. I ain't trust that defense since I saw Derek Thomas back there. All right? As far as I'm concerned, this is still an Andy Reid team, and they will fold when you need them not to. And it appeared that to be the case. But Houston unplugged their controllers. They started to celebrate after being up 24 to 0. And that's exactly why they lost. That's exactly why they lost. Patrick Mahomes, five TDs. Travis Kelsey was dancing all over the secondary of the Texans. I, mm, oh my lord. I ain't never seen something like this in my life. Kansas City's an offensive juggernaut. But I'll tell you this much. Those mistakes that they made, they can't afford to make those mistakes against Tennessee. Because Tennessee ain't one of those teams that's going, ooh, I'm going to fire early. No, they're going to slowly pound away at you. I'm very curious to see how these guys plan to stop, you know, the most Derrick of Henrys uh, um, in the backfield. But hell of a victory for the Kansas City Chiefs and for the Houston Texans. Um, you guys are in that death note. And last but not least, the one game that I initially predicted and got it right, Green Bay Packers took out the Seattle Seahawks. And, um... Early on, Green Bay going into halftime, they were up 21 to 3. All right, Devontae Adams simply could not be covered. I said going into this game, I'm not too sure if I believe that uh, Trey Flowers, Shaquille Griffin, any of the uh, Quandre Diggs, any of these guys will be able to corral, you know, uh, uh, Devontae Adams. And they did not. He had 160 yards receiving. 
the most receiving yards by a Packer, you know, in, in the franchise history. And he did whatever the hell he wanted to do. They simply could not stop this man. And I predicted him to do that. All right. What I did not foresee was, uh, um, you know, Seattle being down so much. But as I told you guys, the way I believe this game to, you know, uh, play out is Seattle making a comeback and they just so happened to fall short. That's exactly what happened. Because in the second half, they came out and had three consecutive touchdown drives. Green Bay was only to respond. They were only able to respond on one of them. And then to make matters worse is Seattle's last possession, they had a, uh, a, a, a tough situation where they had to punt for the first time in the second half. Then their defense, which has played very good for the final 30 minutes, or I should say the last uh, 28 minutes or so, they just needed one stop and they got the situation they wanted. Third and long. And what happens? Aaron Rodgers converts. Now you need another stop, another third and long. Aaron Rodgers finds who? Former Seahawk, Jimmy Graham. Where was the coverage to stop this man? Then to make matters worse, a lot of people were complaining about, well, you know, the um, the yard mark, it appeared that he was short. I'm telling you right now, there's one of the reasons why I didn't address it in my commentary. He got the first down. If you're looking at just the yellow line, you're in for some bad news, as uh, you know, uh, um, bad news Barrett, Wade Barrett would say. All right, because the yellow line is unofficial. What you gotta look for is the pie line. They've had multiple different angles where you can see where the pie line is, and then you'll see where that white line, or, or not the white line, that yellow line is. It's about a ha half of a yard distance between the two. And when you look at where Jimmy Graham fell, it'd be a first down. So that's there's no argument there. I understand Seahawks fans, you may be upset. I understand other football fans feeling as if they got cheated out. Earlier in the game, there was a, a certain call that did not go in Green Bay's way, where Jacob, we don't wear Haynes, we wear Hollister, fumbled on the plate. And in my opinion, clearly got recovered, clearly got recovered by Green Bay did not go in their favor. But at the same time, Aaron Jones' touchdown shouldn't have been a touchdown. Um, I believe it was his first his first one. Shouldn't have been called a touchdown because he got stopped before he got into the end zone. But Bobby Wagner's body obstructed the cameras from seeing where the location of the football is. This, Both those calls fell victim to the whole the initial call on the field, let's go and review it because there's no conclusive evidence to showcase we can overturn the initial call, we're going to have to roll with what we call. It's the same thing that we saw uh, uh, last week with the, uh, the Dalvin Cook touchdown. It got called by one official and they said, you know what, if this one official calls it, at least we can go and review and now you can't see so you got to roll with the initial call and they got screwed. New Orleans in that case. Also to push on, but of course, you guys had a ton of plays. You should have made your plays. You would have won. In this case, with um the Seahawks, two tough calls, but the last one, I have no issues with it. I have no issues with the last one. Jimmy Graham picked up that first down, and I'll tell you this much: Beast Mode, he got himself three touchdowns. Or I should say four touchdowns. Four touchdowns in 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 three in, in two games. Three touchdowns in two games. Whatever the case was. All right, no. Four touchdowns in three games. That's what it was. But um, Aaron Rodgers on the day, 21 of 31, 277, and a TD. Oh, uh, no, pardon me. That was Russell Wilson. Uh, 21 of 31, 277, and one TD. On the ground, he was also their leading rusher because uh, Marshawn Lynch, remember, they said, hey, we're going to increase you know, the amount of balls that he gets this particular game. When you're down by 18 points, you kind of got to do away with the run game. So if they were planning to pound away at that rock, they didn't get that chance. But thank the Lord that they decided to go with the passing attack of Russell Wilson because he gave them an opportunity to win the game. Then for the Packers, um, Aaron Rodgers was 16 of 27, 243 yards and two TDs. 
All right, so he played a very, very good game, and we can't, you know, uh, say enough for the performance of Devontae Adams. And Jimmy Graham had three catches for 49 yards, but you felt as if his presence was felt all doggone day. And on the ground, A.A. Ron Jones, 62 yards, um, enough to aid in them getting the W. And this Packers team, I'm very curious to see how they're going to play against San Francisco this upcoming week. But for tonight, I am going live. Um, or oh, I should say, no, I'm probably going to post this on Tuesday. Nah, fuck it, I'm gonna post it today. But I am going live on the um, the Hot Mic app and also here for the uh, National Championship. So if you have not already downloaded the Hot Mic app, use the promo code Adonis, it's absolutely free, and you can tune in live and hear my thoughts on whatever the hell you wanna go and ask me. Unfortunately, we were not able to go live this past weekend for the divisional you know, games, but we will be live for the National Championship and hopefully Conference you know, Football Sunday. Who we'll knows? I'm really hoping we can get everything um, done for the Super Bowl. A little bit of behind the scenes sort of stuff. I might just address it tonight on Hot Mike. But, you know, uh, that has been your 2019 NFL Divisional Playoff Weekend Post Game Analysis. I have been your host and the CEO of Hold My Nuggets Incorporated. The diligent, vigilant, meticulous, sagacious, conscientious, and a little methodical individual. The Chisel Donuts. Let me know what you guys thought of this past weekend. Were your predictions, you know, right? And who do you think will go on to represent the NFC and AFC in the Super Bowl? All right? But I will see you guys tonight live on Hot Mike and also here on YouTube as well. So I guess I'll see you in, well, by the time this is posted, it'll probably be about four minutes. Matter of fact, no. It wouldn't even be about four minutes because by the time you get to the conclusion of this video, well, I would have already had been live. It will be about like seven minutes left in the first quarter of the national championship. You know what? Whatever. I'm getting the hell up out of here. I'll see you guys tonight.